Hello and welcome to the Master Chess <laughs> web show. <laughs> We're going to do a, a little retake on that because there was a slight technical issue. And the first game we're going to see is Tarash against Teichman. And it was San Sebastian 1912, quite famous tournament. And as you can see, it started... I need to share the screen here because I've forgotten to do that. It started with a French defence, e4, e6. Now, this is one of my favourite picks for players at club level, mainly because it, it's one of the easiest defences against 1e4 to learn, also because you get a lot of nice pawn structures. Uh, there's, there's two things which cause horror amongst people. First of all, the thought that their opponent's going to draw with the exchange variation. And the second is that they may end up with a bad bishop. And the, the reason they're afraid of having a bad bishop is that when you get this, this black bishop on c8 is shut in by the pawn on e6. So some people want to play the Karakan because of it. Now, having said that, I have a great deal of trouble ever finding games where a bad bishop is actually uh, irre irretrievably bad. Why? Usually they get out somehow or other. And in this game, the bishop could have got out. I had Teichman had his, uh, his wits about him at the right stage. He could have got that bishop more active. Um, there's... Looking for games with a really bad bishop is, is uh, a very thankless task, to be honest. Um, and you usually end up going for, for one of three games. There's this one. There's the famous game Schlechter against John, which uh, I think Barman 2000, uh, 1905, not 2000 at all, wasn't in that game. And there's also an Anderson Miles game. That's the most contemporary one you can find where a bad bishop dooms uh, the, the person with it. But most of the time you can get these bishops out. And um, just to give you a little illustration of this, if, if white goes e5, that's the, the most obvious way to, to make this bishop supposedly bad. Then the, the bishop can come out via d7 and b5. So sometimes you can do something like this, queen b6, knight here, bishop d7 and trade it off with bishop b5 you can also play b6 just being careful that you don't play bishop a6 immediately because then you lose a piece to bishop takes followed by queen a4 check and there's another way for the bishop to come out as well which is to bring it round to d7, e8 and then play f6 and bishop g6 or bishop h5 so I actually think it's a myth to uh, to think that the, the bishop in the French is always bad. I think it, in, it almost inevitably gets out. Now, in this game, we have knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop e7, e5, knight fd7, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. And here, uh, queen d2 was played. And black castled, white plays f4, and black plays c5. And this is a very typical undermining move, undermining the pawn chain at the base rather than the head. If you, if you went f6, that undermines the pawn chain at the head. So usually you prefer, first of all, there's a first port of call to undermine it at the base. And now white goes knight f3, knight c6, g3. And here, uh, black plays a6, which is okay. But the modern preference is to play knight b6 here. And this probes the c4 square because black has seen that white may be wanting to put his bishop on g2. So uh, knight b6 this was played in a game between Yuldachev and... Uh, Uli Bin from the Dubai Open in 2004. And it went like this, DC, Queen takes C5, King B1, Rook FC8, and Black had counterplay here. Already you can see that this bishop on D7 is not so bad after all. Well, 
okay, instead of this, uh, Teichman played A6. As a, uh, a small aside, uh, Teichman, Richard Teichman, was known as Richard V at that time. This was a, a pun because he, he always managed to come fifth in the tournaments in which he participated. I'm sure he would have preferred to be Richard I, but he wasn't. He was Richard V. So a little bit of colour for this game. I like to know something about the, the players. Right, Tarash was the uh, one of the great chess teachers of all time. He tended a little bit towards dogmatism. You know, that he, he was a bit uh, prescriptive in his uh, guidance. So he said, a knight on B6 is always badly placed. And... Uh, and, and, and things like this. So it was, he was a little bit, uh, well, um, prescriptive. But there we go, and he was a doctor. So you can imagine he'd be prescriptive. And he lost a world title match, I think, to Lasker in uh, 1908. I'm sure Andrew will be able to confirm whether or not that was true. Yes, I remember it well. Right, okay. And it, at, at one time, he was, he was very good friends with Lasker, but then they had a falling out. And there, there were some rumours uh, around at that time about some uh, adultery or something. <laughs> but that's why they had a falling out. And Tarash famously said, for you, I only have two words, check and mate. That was before he lost. So anyway, <laughs> back to the game. <laughs> B5, castles. C takes D4, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes. Queen C5, this is still okay. But uh, a lot of people would object here. Oh, Black is trading off pieces, and now he's just going to be left with his bad bishop. But as we shall see, this bad bishop can be brought into the action. So now White went knight e2. This knight is heading towards d4. And here already, Black could consider going pawn to a5 in order to play pawn to b4, and lo and behold, this bishop will get out. So you go a5, and then look to play b4 and bishop a6. So that's one way the bishop could emerge back into the game. Now, bishop d7 also isn't bad, because after knight d4, black can still do this a5 thing. He actually went rook a c8. I might have preferred the other rook, I'm not sure. King F2, and now here he had a, a, a really good opportunity to annoy White with Knight A4, because this attacks this pawn, and how's White going to defend it? Well, if he goes B3, then Black will go in Knight C3, and if he goes Rook A B1, then Black can play B4, and once again, the Black position is not so bad. He may still be able to play b5 or you can double on the c file uh you know there's there's lots of options here for black anyway back to the game and black played the uh somewhat uh slightly too methodical rook c7 right because he's not really going to be breaking through on the c file um uh, using his doubled rooks right he needs to do something else White went king e3. Now yeah, it's black... interesting, Nigel. Can I just interrupt you for a second there? Yes, Whenever sure. I show this game to you know players of whatever standard, they always find this king march by Tarash uh, uh, slightly surprising. Um, how would you view it from a grandmaster's uh, uh, angle? Is, is that a is that an easy concept to understand? Well, the the, the king is a strong piece. I mean, it's got the the approximate fighting power of a rook, <laughs> but it needs to be in the thick of the action. Now, obviously, you don't, you don't bring it into the centre when you've got uh, lots of pieces on the board because you might get mated. But as soon as the, the danger of being mated has receded, for example, when the queens and some minor pieces have come off, then that is the moment you should be using this powerful piece. Now, Steinitz, who was another uh, uh, contemporary, or rather forebear of both Lasker and Tarash, uh, used to try and use the, the, the king quite uh, aggressively early in the game. And that was one of his flaws, actually. He, he was convinced that the king was a strong piece and needs to be used. But he, he tended to bring it out very early, as in the Steinitz gambit, 
where, where White allows. So on Queen H4 check and boldly plays King E2. That's not the bomb cloud King E2. I, I can briefly <laughs> show that, actually. I'll, I'll show the, uh, the Steinitz Gambit was like this. F4, E takes F4. And now Steinitz thought it was most important to, to stop D5 and went Knight C3, allowing Black to go Queen H4 check and then bomb clouding up with King E2. Right. Of course, Black would not now play King E7. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might do. <laughs> well, I suppose he might, you know. And then we have a, a draw by repetition again, you know. Oh, <laughs> I really must get paid five million to play the tournament <laughs> and do that. <laughs> anyway, back to the game. We don't want to upset anybody here. <laughs> well, not too quickly. <laughs> so, so, Rook C7. A uh, little bit too systematic. King E3 brings the king boldly into the centre because he's not worried about being mated. And now Black played rook e8. And what you can often do... Now, I, I should say that White's plan in a position like this is normally to do some sort of pawn advance on the king side. That is where he has his space, as shown by having a pawn on e5. And normally he would then start pushing his pawns on the king side. Now, here... Uh, if black was able to play g6 and h5 with his king on e7, he may not have to worry too much about that. And this is a, a known plan in this sort of position, that you have your king on e7 and play g6 and h5. Now, h5 may be possible here as well. Personally, I would again prefer the knight a4 thing and after rook a, b1, go b4. And I, I still think that is not too bad for black. Rook f2, rook fc8, maybe even rook b8 to go bishop b5. And it, you know, once you've got uh, this bishop working, then your position may not be too bad. Got to watch out for f5, of course, but uh, hopefully that will not do us in. Anyway, rook e8 was played. Uh, sort of shadowing white's king, but it doesn't look right to me. Rook f2, knight b7. The knight doesn't look like it's got many prospects here. So uh, if we were to play here knight a4, it's probably still the right thing to do. White also has this option to play pawn to c3 now. But then maybe we can go a5 and, and go for b4. So it, it's still not bad if black is starts playing uh, for some counterplay rather than, you know, playing rook c7. I'm going to double rooks on the c file. Rook e8. Maybe I can attack white's king, you know. And then knight b7. I don't know where that knight is headed. Well, white goes bishop b1, knight a5. B3, well, now it becomes clear. He goes H6, bishop D3, knight C6. Exchanging off knights. But personally, I don't massively like that plan because the, the knight was black's main defender of dark squares. Now, as soon as these knights come off, then you, you can see that white's king may start to get further into the position with uh, bringing the king to D4. And this is what happens. Knight takes c6, bishop takes c6, king d4, bishop d7, g4. So now white is revving up for some uh, kingside pawn advance. The way he does it is quite instructive, actually, because he goes for what Hans Kmoch termed the super quart grip. Uh, Actually, this is this is exactly the type of position you don't want against a really strong player because there's no counter play at all, is there? Yeah, no, no nothing. just sitting there waiting for this onslaught. Yeah. Now, the, of modern players, the the, the the player that I've seen I, who managed to implement this plan quite a bit is uh, Alexander Grishuk, and he plays the advanced <laughs> variation of the French very artfully, and often gets end games of of this nature, although. You know, not quite as advantageous as this one. Uh, I mean, black goes g6, white goes rook h1. And now h5 is coming. 
king g7 h5 and this pawn formation there's four pawns here that's the quart that is known as the super quart grip on the king side uh, normally it's played in slightly different situations uh, the the pawn is moved to h5 normally to stop black playing h5 himself and then inhibiting white's pawn breakthroughs anyway black now goes rook h8 and white doubles on the h file and it notices king is lurking here ready to come into c5 and b6 should this rook on c7 get actively employed elsewhere black goes bishop d7 g5 and now hg fg white is breaking through on the king side rook takes h5 takes pawn takes rook takes king f8 heading for the hills but uh he's not going to get there rook h8 check king here pawn to g6 and rook h7 would also have been good i mean this position is horrendous for black because all of his pieces are so passively placed and now an exchange of rooks if if black was to play rook c8 and, and get the rooks off here then that would be winning for white because the king would just come into c5 i might as well show that actually so if you go here then white can trade this off and just bring his king in this way and that is a winning end game for white i'm i'm quite sure so black goes b4 it's uh the right concept but he's left it rather late in the day check here king here note that this c2 pawn is covered by the bishop on g6 white goes bishop back to d3 hitting the a6 pawn black plays rook c3 maybe we should have played uh, rook c6 now white goes check here pawn to a3 so black cannot take this because the the rook would hang and when black plays a5 white just goes to round up this pawn on a5 with rook a8 uh, at this point teichman decided to throw in the towel as as well he might and that was uh was that another fifth place for teichman might well have been i haven't got the uh, cross table to hand unfortunately <laughs> Ah, oh, we should have it probably a bit pinned to our fridges. <laughs> <laughs> he probably came fifth. He always came fifth. Anyway, Pretty instructive was... game, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Very instructive game. But um, what is... Uh, I mean, I, 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 I think that we need to, to have these little caveats in there because it's often used to, to illustrate how bad these French defence bishops are. But had Teichmann had his wits about him, he, he could have got the bishop out at different stages and got counterplay. Well, it's instructive for the you know, reasons you pointed out. The, the, the opportunities Black had to get that bishop into yeah. the game and didn't take them. That, that in itself is very instructive for French players. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a good game of Tarash we, we should cover sometime where he was Black in the French and he allowed doubled A pawns and then played on the, the, uh, the C and B files. I might be able to dig that one out, but I'm sure, you know, I uh, forget who is against, but, you know, Tarash played quite a few instructive games in the in the French with both colours. And I think he had a pretty good grasp of these pawn structures. Anyway, on that note, let's hand over to Andrew, who is going to show you a game. I am. That's true. Um, I can't Hopefully. actually see my... Oh, yes, I can see myself on the screen. It is working. It's wonderful. It's wonderful when everything works, isn't it? You know, it's uh, it's, it's, it's a rarity in our case, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it's great when it works. Right now, um, what I uh, um, uh, the screen is going psychedelic right now. How oh, how did that happen? <laughs> I don't know. It's it's wonderful effect. Uh, what uh, maybe just go to the zoom? Uh, what why did that happen? Oh, I know what's happened. I know what's happened. I should. I. I need to. I need to stay on on this tab, don't I? I don't know what you're fiddling with there, but it was. Oh, it was really psychedelic, man. Right. Blew my mind. 
I can tell you what happened there. I, I had I had Firefox uh, shared, and then I switched tabs because I thought I would have a little chat with the guests. Right, but <laughs> now <laughs> now that's not going to happen because it, it messes up our uh, <laughs> our screen share. <laughs> so there we go. I think I, I I'd probably need it on a different browser tab, don't I? The uh, sorry b browser window. And then we won't get that effect. Yeah, I wonder if everybody, all these young guys or young people who use this Twitch TV have the same problems. You know, we grapple with this new technology. <laughs> we're getting there. At least we're trying. You know, at least we, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're getting involved. This yeah, is the, main the, thing. The, 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 the big issue is that we're twitching as a, a two-person team, right? And that's when the, uh, the, the technical difficulties began. If you just choose a, uh, you know, a standard Twitch client, then you you know you can twitch to your heart's content, play blitz for the crowd and whatever, but uh, but we're not doing that, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> we I think we're planning live commentaries on uh, live commentaries on big tournaments, are we? World Championship matches. Yeah, yeah. We're going to you know if there's a you know if there's a market for it, if plenty of people want to see us in action, then that will be what will happen. Well, let's not forget we've commented on World Championship matches before. Yeah, uh, together the, and live, right, live yeah. at the time. Yeah, in the no, uh, no uh, internet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, moving on, moving on swiftly. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a game which, again, concentrates on on pawn structure, and um, it's uh, an interesting one because it uh, features the isolated queen's pawn, which, um, of course, is a very common motif in lots of players' games and can occur from many different openings. It just so happens that in this game, it occurs via the Tarash defence of the, uh, the Queen's Gambit. Now, who are the two players here? Well, we've got David Strauss playing with uh, White, um, a veteran, now American, international master. Um, I think he lives in California, if I'm not mistaken, but I could be corrected on that. At any rate, he was born in the UK, and um, he's playing... Grandmaster Daniel King. Well, of course, when this game was played, I'm not sure whether Danny was a grandmaster. Danny today, of course, one of the most famous of chess commentators and, um, you know, very well known throughout the chess world. Now, it's interesting to see that King used to play the Tarash in his youth. He came up, he was born in Kent, I believe, or uh, he used to live in Kent. And a lot of junior players at that time, I remember, because I played most of them in tournaments, used to play the Tarash. They swore by it. And in fact, it's a really good opening for junior players to play because it actually, um, it actually gives back tactical opportunities. Uh, strategically, well, if you're playing somebody really strong, you might struggle, as was seen in the famous uh, match between, the first match between Karpov and Kasparov, where Kasparov insisted on playing the Tarash against Karpov. And um, I don't think he scored too well with it, did he, Nigel? No, no, it was, uh, he, well, he gave it up as a result of that match. And then, you know, later um, thought that the, the, the Grundfeld and Kings Indian were better bets. You know, but you he, get through Beliavsky and Smizlov on his way to the World Championship. But uh, to play it against Karpov, you know, frankly, this is asking for trouble. You know, you give yourself a, a minute weakness, one of the, 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 the very smallest weaknesses you could ever imagine on a chessboard. And Karpov would be on it like a shot, you know. And so... Um, yeah, well, you've got to choose who you play openings like this against. I think it's a question of, of, of proper choice. So at any rate, these two players at the time were rated in 2400, so we can expect a good game. And uh, Strauss was always pretty strategic, and he plays G3. Now, um, White can play G3 a little bit later, preferring Knight C3 in this position. And the difference is that <coughs> after G3 now, Black has got more options than he has when you play the immediate G3. For instance, one option is C4. This is called the Swedish variation. Um, I'm not actually sure it's any good, but it, it just gets to a position which is a little bit different from the average Tarash. I don't know. You either like this or you don't. I, I presume that it's not being played very much in top grandmaster chess, so there's something wrong with it. And the other option is what they're playing these days. They're, they're taking on D4. And then uh, they're playing this move, bishop c5. 
Uh, that's all the rage, isn't it now, Nigel, in, when a Tarash appears on the chessboard? I don't know. I, I, I was last keeping up in the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've seen uh, Duboff playing like this and, and many other Grand Masters. Yeah, this this is, is not supposed it. to be very good for Black. Uh, but um, anyway, that turns out uh, slightly differently in the cold light of day. Going back to our game, we just plod down the main line here, really, where White is reducing Black's options by not putting a knight on C3. Castles, okay. So here we have um, the main line position. And now White's got to make quite an interesting choice. It's interesting that um, Tarash is again involved. This is the Tarash variation. And uh, did he have any? Uh, did he have any controversial comments to say about the isolated pawn, Nigel? Do you remember? Because um, this is well, his own liked, variation. Yeah, he liked direct chess. You know, he 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 didn't like um, uh, too much manoeuvring round. You know, and he he. I think there was a game he he made notes to in some English opening. You know, and and he was very disparaging about how the players were playing. The the, the Tarish basically is quite direct. I, I actually think one of the, the most dangerous lines is not G3 at all, but where White plays knight C3 and takes on C5. I oh, will have to go all the way. Well, actually, this could, that could not be reached by, because White opened not one knight F3. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the Tarash, I think, becomes quite a reasonable option against one knight F3. So if we go back to the start, let's run through this for a second. Yeah. So, so here we have the main line. Takes here. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, ED. Yes. And then this, you say? Yeah, or not, I, I think knight f3, knight c6, and then take on c5. Oh, right. And th what's the difference? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. There's, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I was just sort of browsing through something, and it, it, it you know, th they were struggling very hard to find something adequate for black. I suppose black goes here, doesn't he? Yeah, and then uh, knight a4. Knight a4, yeah. It's got, <laughs> it's got similarities to a line in the Chigger in defence, isn't it? A similar, a similar sort of motif. Yeah, yeah. And, um, of course, if Black wants to, he can, he can give up the bishop pair. I mean, I don't know how, how this works out. Is that clearly better yeah, for White? Yeah, I think that was the line. And, oh. and they, they managed to find ways to, to draw for Black in this line. But, you know, if, you, if you've got to go through all that just to make a draw, then uh, uh, it didn't seem, uh, you know, that... Well, I mean, that could be the problem with the Parish defence uh, anyway, that um, there are certain lines where, you know, Black has to accept that a draw is the best he can get. Something like this is not, not much fun yeah. for Black if he wants to win, you know. Yeah, yeah. It is. It, it's a problem with a lot of openings. I mean, it, you know, at club level, people are playing uh, very often, like for you know, for for fun and you know, a bit of entertainment. When well, of course, one thing before we leave that, the other, the, the, the going back to this mainline variation. Of course, black can play C takes D four, can't it? Yeah, that's yeah. also been played uh, a bit recently with black, um, black showing some new ideas. Yeah, Grishuk, Grishuk has played it. They, they've been putting these positions into cloud engines or whatever and finding resources that uh, were not apparent before. And so I, th I think in, in general what, what's happening is we're actually narrowing the field of, uh, of openings that are considered playable. But occasionally people find something uh, in, in a, some ancient variation which has some surprise value, at least for a few games. Well, that's the narrowing of opening theory is you know, it's actually been, uh, it's been around since the advent of computer technology, hasn't it, really? When yeah. computers were introduced into the game, they started reducing the openings that were being played. Yeah. World Championship matches these days, Queen's Gambits, all Queen's Gambits, Catalans and 1E4E5. <laughs> with your, <laughs> very occasional C5 <laughs> thrown in. Everything else, forget it. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's quite, you know, it, it, it is quite a problem. You know, and they, they, it's, it's filtering down even to club level, I think, you know, so that now you've got uh, uh, players who, who are using engines because the top players are using them. So they, they see who they're playing and, you know, they, they stick an engine on their games or whatever, a cloud engine, and they think, aha, I could do that. It's, it's, it's quite noticeable. There's one young, 
young British player, Brandon Clark, who I think is very good, uh, in certain key games, he's actually avoided his Nidorf and he lost both games that I saw. So he's a you know, huge expert on theory. But then he got worried because he thought his opponents had uh, probably um, analysed some of his key lines and he, he, he just didn't want to go into it. So I think in one game he played a, uh, a Scandinavian and the other uh, a Nimzovic defence and neither of, the, of these worked out very well. He no. stick to his guns. I think chess is, um, chess is becoming more difficult, you know, um, with each successive generation. Uh, I don't know what the future lies. I don't know where the future lies, but it's certainly becoming far more difficult. And standards are rising, aren't they? But as you say, the field is narrowing somewhat. Yeah. Well, basically, it's, it's going to be like, you know, bullet Fisher 960. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, let's, let's not get too controversial. We, we do want to get some followers on this show. <laughs> so we go back to... <laughs> I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Strauss versus King. And um, now why have to make the choice? Well, in the old days, where, when Tarash was playing this stuff, um, I believe one of his main adversaries was Rubenstein. And Rubenstein used to play this move. And that's the most direct way to give Black the isolated Queen's pawn on d5. Um, I don't know whether the reason they don't play this as often as Bishop g5 these days lies in Black playing d4. This is known as the Tarash Gambit. Um, yeah, this, this is what all those Kent players used to play in the dim, distant past. They used to play this variation because it suited them. You know, Black gets an initiative. Uh, I don't know whether this is correct, considered correct these days. But certainly if you're not prepared for it, it could be very dangerous. Um, obviously, Black can play Bishop takes C5 here. That's a more straightforward move. But curiously, D takes C5 is not seen as much as Bishop G5. This is by far the most common move. And it's... Um, Pretty direct. White just clears out the queen side, making room for his rook to come to c1, getting ready for d takes c5, getting ready for bishop takes f6 if necessary. Um, but there are many other moves. White can play b3. Uh, White can play bishop f4. Well, that's not too common. There are other moves uh, too. But bishop g5, yeah, just suits Strauss's strategic style. And Danny played C takes D4, Knight takes D4, and now H6. And this has been the main line for ages. Uh, Black notes that if White takes on F6, and then takes on C6, and then goes Knight A4, which is quite a common idea in these Tarach positions, Black can get plenty of activity just by playing Bishop G4. Um, there's a weak pawn on c6. There's a weak square on c5. But white has also got some issues with his pawn on e2. And black's got the bishop pair. So this would be a typical sort of imbalance in the Tarash, which probably leads to a kind of equal, equal type position. Um, what black must not do is just sit there and let white dominate the c5 square for the rest of the game. But how important is c5 here? Not totally clear to me. I mean, White can't move the knight right now because the b2 pawn's hanging. So uh, Strauss didn't do that. Instead, he just dropped back with bishop e3. And this is the main line. Rook e8, just bringing the rook to a half open file. Rook c1, rook comes to an open file. And then black drops back with bishop f8. So all very, very standard play. And now Strauss changes the pawn structure. Um, well, we saw something like this a moment ago. He took on c6 and now knight a4. What do you think about this position, Nigel? Do you prefer white or black? It'd be interesting to know that. I instinctively prefer white, and it was mainly because <clears throat> one of the, the, the games that impressed me a lot was a game Rubenstein Salva from. Uh, uh, 190 something or other, where Rubenstein just dominated the, the d4 and c5 squares and then eventually won a pawn on the queen side. It's quite quite a good game as well on the same theme. So I, I would be influenced by that. 
I, I've always been more of a kind of structuralist. But at the same time, I'm aware that uh, I have this bias and that it may actually be reasonably OK for black. Uh, there are two big differences to the position we just looked at recently. Number one, black bishops are on F8 and not F6, um, which means that white has got less pressure to deal with. I mean, the pawn on B2 looks pretty safe. White can play bishop C5 now, trade off the dark square bishops. And, and the knight on F6 is, is not great right now. And the black still got to think about defending uh, the C6 pawn. So the E2 pawn covered, the B2 pawn is covered. So it makes sense to play like this. And I would say this type of position, if, if white plays half sensibly, is really difficult to win with black. That is, that is the problem with this position. Drumming up winning chances from a, from a situation like this. It's really, really difficult. Um, having said that, is it so easy for White to demonstrate an advantage? I'm not so sure. At any rate, it's probably slightly easier for, uh, for White to play. Now, Danny played Queen A5. Okay, I put a question mark by that move um, because it, uh, it's based on tactics. What Black should probably play here is Bishop D7. I mean, you can understand why he doesn't because it's just a passive-looking move, horrible-looking move. And Black is certainly slightly worse after it. But it defends against, looks like, C6. Which, uh, clearly, Danny didn't think that Strauss could play. But, lo and behold, he did. And now, Bishop D7. Well, um, it, I, I've offered this position many times in the Guess the Move competition. That, that it's really difficult for them to find why it's next move. Um, it's Bishop D2. And I'm sure that Danny saw this position uh, in his mind's eye before he went in for this. And he probably thought, well, Queen B5 is, is holding things together. But unfortunately, it's another mistake. Um, having said that, I'm not sure whether Black can really get out of this alive. Rook, um, it's all tactical. This whole, whole line is very tactical. Rook C5. And extraordinary move. Um, and if Bishop takes a4, we get this, we get this amazing position. Well, I think, what do you think, Nigel? I think black is clearly worse here, isn't he? Uh, it's uh, horrible for black because he's, um, white's got the two bishops, very strong bishops, and the a7 pawn's a target. <coughs> I mean, if he can try and run his D pawn down the board, then he might uh, have some kind of chance. But it's, at the moment, it's pinned against the. I rook think in order eight. to do that, you've probably got to sacrifice a pawn, haven't you? Uh, Put the well, rook in behind the pawn and push it, but it doesn't look great. Yeah, yeah, or, or the exchange, but then the the pawn's still blockaded with bishop D two, so it. it it looks horrible for black. If the bishop comes to d4, then I would say black is tantamount to lost. I mean, just back it up. To this position. I mean, I, I can understand fully why queen a5 was played. It, it would require extremely good calculation, you know, to, to see through that, that variation that we just looked at. Yeah. A lot going on. Anyway, Strauss was really on the ball here. Bishop d7, bishop d7, bishop d2, queen b5. And now an excellent move. Rook takes f6. Which uh, probably came as a shock. What do you think, Nigel? Uh, this is a shocking move, isn't it? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, <laughs> he... Um, uh, He's found some quite sharp stuff. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, he was a very good player, Strauss, when, yeah. you know, when he was playing. And not only was he very well prepared, he, he, he was a good tactician too and understood enough about positional play. So he's, you know, pretty good player. He, I, I saw that in the uh, Accelerated Dragon, he found some important ideas for White, you know, which... which um, put Black under a lot of pressure in some key lines. So he's like really well prepared before it became very fashionable. Mm. And, uh, you yeah, know, this whole tactical sequence again is very good. Hey, good player. 
And um, yeah, <laughs> this is this looks winning for White now because they. Uh, the, the well, it's certainly, it, it's extremely uncomfortable for Black. I mean, he took the rook. Um, if he takes the knight on a4, then we just swap the queens off and go rook f5. And this is, again, very uncomfortable. Yeah. Because uh, if he takes on e2, we take on d5, and that wins the house, I think. Um, the rook's attacked on a8. f7 is attacked. I know he's attacking d2, but... You know, once he's, what's he going to do here? There's, there's no real move. Yeah, and the White's well, next move will be Bishop C three, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's see what oh, Black plays first. Uh, Black's got to play a move. <laughs> I know what you mean. I don't um, know. Rook, rook D eight. Bishop yeah. takes F seven. Check. King moves. And bishop bishop C three. And just uh, sit on him. Very unpleasant. Yeah. Two points. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Uh, so he took on F six to cut a long story short. Now Knight to C three. Nice and forcing. Queen takes b2, and in comes the knight. And um, white's threats are considerable. Black's king is in dire straits. Um, there are all sorts, of, all sorts of ideas for white. Bishop c3, knight c7. Uh, Black's king is in really a desperate condition. He played rook c8. Now this beautiful move, bishop c3. Um, again, I, I'm pretty sure Black would have seen this move, but what could he have done about it? This is the question. And the idea is that when you play rook takes c3, we're going to take on f6. We're not going to bother uh, with that uh, that lousy rook on c3. King h8, and, and the Black position is falling apart. All these pieces seem to be unprotected. I like that solid structure around the white king. If you compare the king position, you know, you can see why, why Black is losing. Anyway, Black's a rook is attacked, f7 is attacked, he defended, and now queen to f5. Beautiful play. And uh, that, that finishes, the, finishes the, uh, the job, I think. Yeah. If queen very, to c2. Very impressive game, this. It's impressive in, in every respect. Bishop e4, I think that's, that's curtains. Yeah. So king to g7, and white just finished off very nicely here. Lovely switchback, knight to f6. I really like that. And, uh, and black resigns. Um, well, what do you want to play? Bishop g7. Uh, then queen f5, I think. Yeah, queen f5. Wins the, uh, uh, a slight change in position, but a massive change in the result. Because before black maybe could defend, now there's no chance. So a lovely game there in the Tarash. And... Um, it's not an easy defence to play at all. It, 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 it's tactical. It can be rewarding, but it's not not one of the easiest, is it, Nigel? No, no. It's uh... so that's that's good. We pass now back to Nigel. He's going to take a look at a, <laughs> a Magnus Carlsen game. Well, we might we might only have time for for one more game today. Um, do you, do you want to do the the Carlsen game or or the Mark Hebden game? Well, we could go on a bit longer, couldn't we? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I think the Hebden game. Uh... Still have an hour. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go do... to the Hebden game then. Okay, we'll do the Hebden game. Right. Do the Carlson do game next time, maybe. You, you that start it off because I know I, I know you've recently written a book about this, and I will I will interject. Written a book and um, published a chess-based DVD on it. So um, the barrier attack, yeah. Well, I'm I'm right. Sorry, I'm writing a book right now on the barrier attack, and uh, it's proving quite an interesting challenge. Um, do, you, do you think it'd be a suitable opening for the uh, more mature grandmaster? <laughs> well, a lot of really strong players are playing it. Uh, if we just get to the first critical position, by the way, this is a game between Mark Hebden, who has been really the uh, leading grandmaster, world leading expert, I would say, on the Barry attack. He's probably played it more often than anybody else on the planet over the past 30 years. The Barry attack, um, well, funnily enough, it was, um, it was an invention of, I think, Tata Kova or, or maybe Frank Marshall. One of these two guys, they used to play this. They played this opening in the dim distant yeah, past. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a, a Marshall game with an exchange sack on H5. 
Yeah. I think it was H4H5 and Saxley Exchange. So it's not an entirely new concept. In fact, Capablanca played it too, can you believe? Um, I've put all these games in my book. I, I've written a historical record of how, how the barrier attack evolved over time. But in fact, um, it only became really popular um, during the 1980s. Um, the Bangladeshi Grandmaster, Niaz Murshed, used to play it a lot. Ian Rogers used to play it a lot, uh, the Australian Grandmaster. And then it suddenly took off in England with players like Julian Hodgson and David Norwood. Um, all sorts of players like this used to, used to demolish people with this almost unknown opening. And, Arthur um, Kogan. Sorry? Arthur Kogan. Hope you've got yeah, something. Yeah, Kogan used to play. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And a lot of grandmasters have, have, have really uh, taken to it. I mean, in the present day, Leveronian has played it a lot with White, but in the new style, which we'll see in a minute. Anyway, this game, Hebden Birnbaum, is very much old style. It's a, it's a typical uh, Barry demolition job. It, it, it shows dramatically why people were, were, were coming to play this opening. Uh, back in the 1980s. And even today, you know, among club players, I still think it's a great weapon for club players because, you know, it's very easy to learn and um, nothing particularly complicated about White's play. Pretty straightforward in the old Barry way. And, um, yeah, no reason why he shouldn't be played. I mean, I think Black can get good play against if he knows what he's doing. But uh, how many people at the normal level, sub-master level, know what they're doing? Uh, I'm not totally convinced that they do. And if I look at the games with the barrier attack in the present day, I, I see that even among really strong players. They haven't got a clue what to do against it. So um, let's crack on with this game. Hebden versus Burnboyne. And here is the Barry move order. This, uh, I, I should mention, by the way, that, that Burnboyne is a, a known expert of the Grunfeld defence. So if you want to sidestep the Grunfeld uh, or the King's Indian, then the Barry is the way. Well, I, I think he tries to treat this like a Grunefeld position because he goes D5, but it's not like that at all, actually. Um, it turns out to be completely different. In the Grunefeld, white plays C4. That loosens the white pawn centre a bit, and the Grunefeld is full of sharp attacks on the, the white pawn centre. Here, it's much more difficult for Black to attack the pawn centre because white's going to play E3, and he may even play knight b5 and c3 solidifying the pawn on d4 even more so it's much more difficult for black to um to attack the white pawn center having said that and we'll see this in a minute we'll just go down the game uh, for a little while um, i'm pretty sure the best move for black is to go c5 and that will of course be covered extensively in the book i'm pretty sure that move gives black uh, a very good play against the barry but uh you see a lot of Hebden games that he wins against this so uh Perhaps it's not so bad. Now, I want to go back to this position, back even one more move, let's say. A lot of players, they become fearful at this point of the Barry, and so they play Bishop G7, and then, hey, presto, after E4, D6, we're in a classical perk. So we've got a little transpositional device there. White might be able to trick Black into a classical perk. And one of the best ways to do this for white is to play bishop f4 here um you know white can white can for instance we fiddle, we fiddle with the move order a little bit here if we if we play bishop f4 here and then go knight c3 here which i have seen played and then black plays here you're more or less forced into that line of the classical perk now i mean obviously in the classical perk white would normally play on the fifth move well, if you're going to move this bishop, bishop e3. That's by far the most common move. And I have seen bishop g5. Now, why don't they play bishop f4? This is the interesting question, because it's getting pretty good results. Well, when I was learning Perk Modern, a long time back, when Keen and Botter all bring out their books, I thought that black should play knight c6 here. That's probably one of the best moves here. And the idea is that if white goes d5, black goes e5. And, and this, has proved, uh, this has proved quite an interesting challenge, this variation, which, again, I'm going to cover in the book quite extensively. Um, basically, I advocate that white doesn't push forward right away, just plays queen to d2. There are some interesting games with this. There's one game between uh, Ponomario and Vasiela Grave, where black plays bishop g5 here, and now, now white goes d5. 
and we get an incredibly sharp position uh, which could arise here. Uh, something like this. Absolutely crazy stuff. And uh, all hell breaks loose. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that'll all be in the book. And it, it's quite an, interesting, uh, quite an interesting chapter in the book. You know, what happens when Black allows the classical perp? And this, this old but yet new line, Bishop F4. Anyway, going back to Hebden Burnboyne, um, we get a typical Barry. And now Hebden played E3, which was, of course, all the rage back in the 1980s. That, that is the Barry main line. It's not White's only option, though. White's got quite a few options here. Queen D2. Uh, you mentioned Kogan, I think, didn't you? Yeah. This is one of his favourites, isn't it? The so I, I don't yeah, know how yeah. he got the name, the Tarzan Attack. How did it get that name? <laughs> I, I, this, this is what I saw. He, he wrote some. Uh, he he wrote some articles in the uh, New in Chess uh, uh, Weird Lines booklets, right? And, and and this was one of them, right? Oh. Too. And it's uh, you know it's not to be taken lightly by Black, otherwise he's going to get mated on the king side. Well, clearly the idea is uh, just Bishop H6, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Black, Black can do a number of things against this line. He can play, uh, for instance, the immediate knight e4. That's quite interesting. Uh, that is one move. Turns out, I mean, I, I've looked at this line with, with regards to writing the book. I think Black could even castle here, allow this move, and then put the knight in on e4. And this, this leads to another very sharp position where I don't think White gets any attack. I mean, uh, you know, there's no Tarzan here. You know, this is, this is, uh, this is not so easy to, uh, you know, break through. Can't, so, can't, um, can't you take on E4 and G7? And then play yeah, 95 okay. or something. And now, your next trick? Uh, well, Knight E5 is the obvious move. Yeah, and then and then black could play uh black could play some black could play some moves. Yeah, I mean that, that this is one of them. Okay. And uh castles go for the better end game. Castles queen side. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you can do this, yeah. Yeah. There's also some Queen D six ideas. Anyway, the point is this did not happen. Um and the most common move these days is this crazy move knight b five, isn't it? Um, yeah, this is what Aroni has been in, been playing, and and several other really strong players. It looks like Black has to play Knight A6, and then White goes E3, and we get an interesting position where Black doesn't really want to play Knight A6, and if he plays C6, which looks like it gains time, White happily drops the Knight back and. Black's got some issues with that knight on a6. I think this is the problem with this variation. It takes so long to get the knight back into the game that uh, White's hoping to build up some sort of advantage uh, by so doing. Incidentally, Nigel, a bit quick question for you, and you're probably not going to be able to answer this on the cuff, off the cuff. <laughs> if, 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 you played, if you played here and I played here, what would you play? <laughs> Well, knight takes c7, knight h5, presumably. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Knight yeah. takes c7. This is a good, good, good answer in a bullet game. You know, <laughs> knight, knight. Now, now what? I don't know. <laughs> no. Bishop e5. Okay, no. Good. Uh, at least you're honest. Uh, just going yeah. back. If you go, bishop takes c7. Yeah. That, is that a pawn? Well, it he's... all depends. It all depends on your view of. Uh, it all depends on your view of this position. All right, bishop takes b8. Yeah, well then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm hoping to get a signed copy of this book. I'll swap you. What shall I swap you? Uh, <laughs> would you like a signed copy of the Queen's Gambit Decline? <laughs> Solidify your game a bit. <laughs> it sounds uh, remarkably fascinating. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, the point is that uh, Black can also White can also play H3 in this position. There are there are other moves, and I've even I've even faced this move um, once or twice on the internet. And the main motivation behind that is to play the original Barry without allowing Black the possibility of playing Bishop G4. 
which is again a, a sharp line. White should do this, and then he chops this off, and then he goes C six. And okay, White maybe a fraction better, but it's so solid for Black, solid but passive. And so they played ninety five first to avoid that. So there are all sorts of uh, there are all sorts of uh, different and interesting ways to play this this. Uh, I won't say it's a new Queen's Ball system, but it's it's uh, still a little bit uncharted. It's just anyway, it's just another reason to play the Queen's Gambit decline with Black. Yeah, avoid this altogether. That's it. You know, these newfangled Grunfeld defences. <laughs> Don't touch it with a barge pole. Anyway, <laughs> Black Castle. Uh, now White could go Knight B five again, but this time, of course, Black can answer with Knight E eight. Should he so desire? Um, so white played bishop e2. And now this move b6, which actually I don't like. You know, it's absolutely normal against the Tory attack or um, against the London system even or against the Stonewall or against all sorts of Queensborne systems. Against the Barry, it's asking for trouble. And uh, nobody better than Mark Hebden to set the bonfire alight with knight e5 bishop b7 and now this move h4 and this is the traditional barry attack which i think appeals to <laughs> players of all classes especially <laughs> when it works <laughs> you know it's not exactly difficult to understand why it's going to plow on with h5 and try and completely wipe black off the board which of course he succeeds in doing in this game Really uh, how do you feel when you have to face this stuff? <clears throat> if they're coming at you <clears throat> well, right I, out of the open with this sort of stuff. The, the, the thing is, as soon as they play some move that, you know, with some H4 thing, and the, the, the other new one is D4, Knight F6, C4, G6, H4. Right. So that's very popular as well. Well, I, I, would, I would be looking at just C5, D5, B5. I want to, uh, to get some play against these things. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're changing the pace of the game when they do this. So you, you, you need play. You can't just sort of sit back and think, it'll be all right, you know. It's like the, the old Frank Marshall, Amos Byrne uh, pipe <laughs> story where he didn't get his pipe lit before he's checked back. <laughs> Coming in, Frank Marshall's, uh, is it his best games? Yeah, I think he called it that. Yeah, best games, Frank Marshall's best games. Marshall against Byrne. It's all over in about 15 moves. <laughs> that was a bishop takes h7 check job wasn't it <laughs> i think so yeah yeah so well anyway burn boy like you say this this move is like holding a red rag out to a bull isn't it <laughs> you know it, it's really asking for it and he gets it because hebden pushes on g5 and now this uh, splendid move bishop takes g5 which uh Well, he couldn't have expected it. Got to take it. What else? On we go. The h pawn marches on, marches further. And now Black's got an extra piece. But in all other respects, his position is, is in tatters. Because he can hardly move. You know, White actually plays the rest of this game in slow motion almost. And, and Black hardly has anything to do. The bishop on h8 is the extra piece. Isn't that wonderful? So, on we go. Bishop d3, Hebden building up nicely. Bishop a6, he's trying to get the pieces off. An echo of Nigel's comments earlier about the bad French bishop. This is the bad Barry bishop. <laughs> Queen comes out to f3. It's amazing. Hebden just takes his time. He's got all the time in the world here. Because Black is in a horrible mess. Queen to d6. Queen to f5. That's what I meant. Slow motion. A slow motion attack. Black is completely paralysed. He played rook d8. Queen takes g5, check. King f8. And now another very calm move. King e2. Connecting the rooks. Well, I'm not sure what advice to offer Black, really. I mean, uh, I guess... Uh, I guess Hebden's just going to bring his rooks in, which is exactly what he does in the game. One rook. The other rook. And now is he threatening queen g8, check? I think he probably the is king, he or isn't he? I think he is threatening Queen G8 check. Can't the king get out to E6? 
Well, there's a rook takes f7, mate, at the end, isn't there? Let's have a look. Let's let's give Black an absolutely ridiculous move. Rook a7. Rook a7. You you you're on you're on my way, mate. That is utterly ridiculous. So what if we go here? Yeah, knight takes, pawn takes, queens. We'll take a queen. Takes. Yeah, rook, this is mate, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Oh no, can he can he escape? Let's see. Yeah, I thought he could get out to e6, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, maybe he can. Knight f6. But you, you, you probably win with white if you just take the rook on d8 or something, you know. No, that's just that's just vulgar, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, I don't think white needs this. You know, he can. He can no, he doesn't. He doesn't need any sort of flashy play at all, as Hebden shows. So Burnborn played queen e6. It's not mate this time because black is defending f7, and Hebden just moves his rook in. Really, really beautiful play. I mean, that really is desperation, isn't it? Of course, if he moves the knight, queen g8 is the end of the road. So, pawn takes f6. Pawn takes pawn. Not exactly difficult now. We're picking off the remains. And that was the end. It says score sheet illegible. Uh, which is perfectly understandable. Understandable <laughs> from Black's point of view. You know, I will, <laughs> I, will, I will be shaking at this point. <laughs> Actually, if I remember correctly, Burnboy used to get into time trouble, didn't he? I seem uh, to remember him playing yeah, with the yeah. Lord's Back I mean, Masters. Calculated a lot. He's a very, very dynamic, forceful player. Yeah. You know, so uh, this, uh, he, yeah, I mean, in this game, he would be calculating a lot for, you know, and probably not coming to any happy conclusion through all these uh, calculations, you know, just sort of not seeing a way a way out. I'll calculate that he didn't uh, repeat B6 <laughs> in the future game. Yeah, yeah so that's, that, that, that type of game is very attractive to club players, isn't it? I mean, you know, you love to play that sort of stuff down the club. Yeah, well, yeah. And I you mean, know it, what you shouldn't be able to. Yeah, it, it's a nice, easy plan. I mean, there's, you know, the, there's other openings as well, you know, of course, especially if Black plays the correct 1d5. And <laughs> <laughs> or, the, the, or the correct nice f6 and e6, instead of, you know, playing the very risky g6, you know. But, um, yeah, of course, you know, a lot of people now are playing two bishop f4. Uh, that's also interesting. Is that covered at all in the book? Uh, well, only in a, a transpositional move order way. Okay. I talk about the different move orders that White uh, can try if he wants to reach a Barry. So I mean, this is, this is just one of isn't it? Knight C3. Sorry? Uh, uh, well, yeah, you can, play, you can play Knight C3 here, of course. Uh, and then you've got uh, this position. And the difference between this and the Barry is, of course, that um, the Knight's still on G1. Yeah, so, so White can play the, F3. Uh, yeah, the accelerated Tarzan with Queen D2 here. Yeah, this is the Jababa <laughs> London system, isn't it? This is the Jababa London system. It's, it's a different uh, kettle of fish. Yeah, but only with G6, because the, the Jababa is actually probably just bad if Black plays 3 6 So if you go... Well, I think actually if uh, I cover this in the book, it would be about a thousand pages. So, uh, yeah. because, you know, it's a completely different system to the Barry. Right. The Barry is very specific that White plays Knight F3, Knight C3. Well, you could do that next time. Yeah, you could do. You could all, you you could play bishop f4. There are a number of ways to get the barry, but I think here, why would you play knight f3? I'm not sure. I would play knight f3 here. Uh, I think I prefer f3 or queen d2 or something. Yeah, even e3 because there's no. Well, it, you know, why play knight f3 and, and limit your yeah. options? You know, you can play it this way around for sure. Yeah. Well, it's another another reason not to you know not to play two g6 with black. I think you know. How about a Benoni? Nobody plays a Benoni these days. <laughs> so not are we are we back on Wednesday at ten thirty? We are on. Yeah, we'll be back on Wednesday. We'll do we'll do uh, Carlson Rajabov and uh, and two more games. Excellent. And then you've got your house move on Thursday, but the the show must go on. <laughs> well, uh, if we if we've got a future show on Monday, I should be installed by then, so that should be all right. Okay. Great. Well, okay, that was a good show. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, thank you very much to you too. And, and thanks uh, to everybody I'll, who's watching. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it was a huge audience. Anyway, <laughs> I'll see you on Wednesday.
Yeah, cheers. Okay, bye. And goodbye to everybody watching.